So I go home in Whistler, right? And I was dealing with stars of David's and all this stuff. I knew that I eventually I would have to like go to my local church. And um, I got a Bible and, you know, I started to study it. And I studied it uh, and I had very amazing experiences at the same time. And, um, and I started to study it in details, get different Bibles, different translation, you know, and and I uh, looked at the text, and, and I, you know, all of a sudden, I realized that the Bible was not actually what I remembered it to be. Uh, you know, mostly because I was, uh, as a young kid, I was studying the New Testament, but, um, but because it was Christian. But I started to read the Old Testament, and uh, it was really... Um, amazing. I was reading it, and it didn't seem that my concept of the uh, Hebrew God was, had been appropriately uh, being uh, interpreted by the Catholic Church, because I was remembering some guy on a throne somewhere with a beer uh, with a pair of binoculars and a two-by-four waiting for me to screw up, you know. And I was very stressed about that. But, um, but the way I was reading the Old Testament, it was quite different. It didn't describe God in such a way. Um, it described it in something much more close to what my studies were about. And... Uh, I was stunned by that. For instance, in the Bible, you can find the description of God as uh, some kind of equilateral triangle on a throne, right? It had to do with geometry. <laughs> uh, and um, I was stunned by that. I mean, it, it wasn't an old man um, uh, considering me as a sinner, uh, but it was some kind of geometry uh, that was described as the throne of God, the point of interaction uh, between human and God. And there was various illusion to it in, in very specific parts of the Bible. And eventually I saw that uh, they were describing as well these angels that, that radiated in this tetrahedron and and describing it as like crystal sea and, and all sorts of things that made me think of technologies and, and geometries and physics much more than some old guy uh, with a beer on a throne. And um, I was kind of, I was surprised. That's not what I had remembered. And I continued to study it. And... I realized that the Old Testament is ambiguous because the Old Testament described God not as something that's somewhere in the sky or anything. It describes God as an object. It describes that they have some kind of link or communication with God through an object um, that they call the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they weren't kidding about that. I mean, when you read the Bible and, and with archaeologists find, uh, they actually built one of the largest temples in the world, the Temple of Solomon, to put this object in the middle. It was a very, very large temple with extraordinary large stones. And, and it was um, this ark object had to be shielded from everybody else. And it was enclosed in this holy of holy in the center of the temple of Solomon that was, in the, that was surrounded with concentric walls, very thick walls, in which uh, initiates had to go through very specific initiation level to be able to go from one wall to the other. And only the few could ever go into the Holy of Holy. And they describe all sorts of things that happened if you went in the Holy of Holy or in the tabernacle without having gone through all the appropriate 
levels of initiation. If you weren't ready, it didn't seem like it was a pretty sight when you came out, right? And if you did. And so um, I was intrigued with that. I was looking at many of these plates where they showed this arc object, this box that had gold on the outside, gold on, uh, on the inside, and wood in the middle. And right away, I realized that's got to be a capacitor. And sure enough, you know, if you do a box like that, you can generate large capacitance. Uh, capacitors are, are like batteries. They, they hold uh, energy. They hold uh, charge. And then the difference between a capacitor and a battery is that a capacitor can discharge extremely rapidly, where a battery cannot. Uh, and so uh, capacitors are used in all sorts of electronics today. But uh, basically, there are uh, an electrical, a dielectric, and an electrical plate, which creates uh, like, a, like a container for energy. So, and these, in this large arc capacitor was described uh, as uh, having a sphere or a thing in the middle of it that was very radiant. Like they described how they had to shield themselves from it. Uh, and they had to wear very specific clothing to go in there. And that uh, if they didn't, they would come out of there with a sunburn, basically, like burnt into their face and, and so on. But then I kind of came across something. Well, what happened is I thought, but wait a minute, they're calling this the Ark of the Covenant of God. And I was like, well, what does God mean? Uh, and so I was looking for an answer to that, and I did a lot of research, and I couldn't find exactly, you know, this Yahweh and all this, and and uh, I couldn't find exactly, and then eventually, I actually just opened the, the preface of my Bible by error or something. I, I started reading it, and I found the answer. <laughs> and uh, it says right here uh, that uh, the name Yahweh, the divine name Yahweh, uh, H, uh, Y-H-W-H, is uh, currently uh, the translation or is used as uh, the... Greek terminology, the tetragrammaton. Now, for a guy like me, when you are reading one of the most, you know, sacred books on the planet, I guess, and the person is describing God, and the translation is tetragrammaton, okay? Uh, I'm starting to have ideas. Can you, you know, okay. You guys probably can see where I'm going there, right? I was stunned. Imagine that. Every time you read the word God in the Bible, you could translate tetragrammaton. So you could replace all the gods and lords in the Bible to tetragrammaton. And then you get a really different reading. Okay? It's like, oh my tetragrammaton. And so I, I looked at the epidemiology of this, and I thought, well, the word tetragrammaton is typically, uh, you know, if you look at the root word, the tetra refers to four, right? The four faces of a tetrahedron. Typically, the translation is then done uh, as tetra for four, grammaton for grammar. And grammar or letters is interchangeable, and so it's the four letters of God. Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. And grammaton was what was intriguing me, so I digged a little deeper, and I found that actually the word grammaton has a, a deeper root then grammar, in which it refers to the uh, weight of an object. And that's where the word gravity and gram came out of. So all of a sudden, you could have a different interpretation of this word that says tetra 
sanhedrin gravitation right okay something along those lines right uh, i know that might sound very you know uh a long leap right but uh but this was where i started and i was really keen on uh continuing my research because it was promising they were talking about tetrahedrons or triangles on the seat of god and they were describing tetragrammatons for the force of god and i was getting you know inspired to say the least so i continued to research and i with this word tetragrammaton i was able to look further and and dig deeper and i was uh, intrigued uh there's a lot of sacred societies that have a lot of information and all this uh, one of them and certainly there seemed to be an oral tradition that was passed uh, in the rabbinic tradition from one to the other to the other throughout the ages uh, that wasn't allowed to be written it's very clear in the bible that the name of god or the source of god whatever this god was was not allowed to be just discussed publicly it was very sacred and it had to be transferred from one initiate to the other in very sacred way and its traditions that transferred the information were called kabbalistic tradition so i started to study the kabbalah and the kabbalistic tradition and what they had to say about the tetragrammaton and when i did i came across very esoteric various esoteric uh manuscript that we're going to we're going to see in a minute but the other thing that puzzled me is that in many instances the word tetragrammaton and ark of the covenant and all this in the description of what was going on there it was describing something very interesting to me because it kept on talking about the force of god or the tetragrammaton having a vortex of fire or a vortex of clouds above it and it describes it in the bible in various instances and it says that you know that is where the power of god is manifest to man and in and for instance in this uh, graphic they show this is when the hebrews were going through the desert for 40 years they had a uh, uh, temporary tent system to host the ark in the middle and uh, they called the tabernacle and they uh show here the vortex of cloud uh ray rising above the ark of the covenant that's in the back of the tabernacle uh just so you understand this is the fire of sacrifices that are in front and you see the the smoke just dispersed but in this case it's very organized vortex type of smoke or or clouds that orbit on the top of this uh this object from my previous studies and from my physics concepts I had come to conclude that for instance the black sun or the black crystal described in other civilization may have been given by the sun god to humans as a very advanced technology like a little sun in the box a singularity created artificially inside a stone or a crystal that contain plasma dynamics spinning at high angular velocity generating a torque in space time producing gravitational effects and energy effects if that is true then you would expect that on the top and the bottom of that structure you would see vortices appear columns of clouds or columns of light appear because of the high velocity of the space-time angular momentum along the side of that object at the north and south pole of that object large vortices would be produced 
there's a chapter here if you want references so you can uh, look it up yourself in Numbers. It's called the cloud above the tabernacle and it described that vortex cloud above the tabernacle. There's, a, there's chapters where the sons of Aaron get struck by the Ark of the Covenant and die and uh, uh, Moses is called into the tabernacle and instructed to never let anybody go in there without permission because the vortex of the Ark of the Covenant, if it's not dealt with appropriately, can kill. Um, there's all sorts of things like that that happen in the Bible that, you know, were striking. But the thing is, is that I started to realize that when you read the Bible, the Ark of the Covenant, this box-like object, was supposed to be built at the foot of Mount Sinai after Moses crossed the Red Sea. So I was confused because um, when I read the crossing of the Red Sea, I was, uh, I was struck that it said here, by day the Lord went ahead of them. They are going towards the Red Sea, fleeing from Egypt. It says, the, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left in its place in front of the people. So it's describing Moses following this vortex of cloud, and at night it would light up, this vortex of fire, through the desert going towards the Red Sea. But the description of the same vorticular action and the same description of this cloud thing cloud pillar is given uh, when it's describing the Ark of the Covenant. So I realized, wait a minute, maybe the word of God, the information of God that was not allowed to be discussed was the part about the source of the energy of the Ark, not the box. The box was built afterwards to put that energy source in it so they could travel through 40 years in the desert. I started to see, to think maybe these are two different objects. And Moses is following something, a power source, something that's creating a vortex in space, and it's coming out of Egypt. And then I realized, wait a minute, Moses was son of Pharaoh for 40 years, initiated in the highest level of initiation of the Egyptian before he realized that he was Hebrew and left with the tribes of Israel. So if there was a power source, if the pyramids of Egypt were not just built to bury Pharaohs, which I believe weren't built to do that at all, and were actually shielding device or resonating cavities, resonating space-time in a very specific geometric structure, but that they were missing their power source at the center. So I took the dimensioning of the Ark of the Covenant as given in the Bible. It's quite precise. And I got the dimensioning of the inside of the sarcophagus in the Grand Pyramid of Giza. And it was a perfect match. That is, if you have the Ark of the Covenant built, you will be able to lower that box into the sarcophagus of the Grand Pyramid of Giza, okay? And it will fit perfectly on the side and perfectly on the length so that you can lower it with the poles and push the poles in, which are telescopic on the Ark. And then I realized that the inside volume inside the sarcophagus is exactly half of the outside volume of, the, of that sarcophagus. Exactly, I mean, very highly precisely. And if you take the dimensions of the arc, 
then you got exactly half the volume of the inside of the sarcophagus. And then if you take the dimension of the inside of the arc, you get exactly half of the outside uh, dimensions of the arc. So you get perfect octaves of cavity or resonance cavity inside the sarcophagus. So I started to think maybe this object is not an Hebrew object. Maybe this object actually got taken out of Egypt by Moses when he left with the Israelites. And that might be a reason why after the king of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt, allowed Moses to leave, all of a sudden realized that he was taking off with the power source and changed his mind and went after him. All right, you know, that's very interesting. I start to have, I'm starting to have a better picture of what's going on. I, I you know, I'm extrapolating and, and I got some supporting evidence later, we'll see it. But I started to see, uh, I started to study ancient Egyptian texts to see if there was any evidence of that. And I found plenty, but one thing that struck me is that there's a story about a king of Egypt, a pharaoh, that's on a lake with his, uh, with his wife, and, it, and, and she loses uh, a very precious, beautiful bracelet in the lake. And the pharaoh and the, the wife is quite distraught, and the pharaoh really wants to do something about it. And so the story goes to say that they call the high priest of Egypt, and they come and they open the waters of the lake to find the bracelet and give it back to the queen. And I thought, oh, sounds like these guys, hundreds of years before Moses, was, were doing things similar to open the Red Sea. Now, imagine that you had the power of gravitation under your control. You could do things like stopping the course of water, okay, and opening channels. Um, you could push things around. So I started to think about it, and, um, and but when I read um, Exodus and the crossing of the Red Sea, I saw no evidence. It just says that Moses went to the front of the sea, raised his staff, opened his arm, and the thing opened, right? So I'm like, well, that's some serious staff you got going. <laughs> and then I came across something that was much more descriptive. And that's typically lost by the scholars. In this, uh, in this chapter, it's called uh, Joshua. Um, in Joshua is much later after Moses. They've gone through the desert. Moses is now gone, is dead. And Joshua is in charge of the Israelites. And they, are, they arrive upon the Jordan, which is a large river, uh, especially when it's running at flood level. And they mention in here that it is running at flood level. And they need to cross uh, the river. And they don't know how to do it. Uh, at the time, there was no bridges. And so they uh, are in a conundrum, and uh, Joshua is instructed uh, to take the ark uh, and put all the high priests on the ark and then walk the ark into the Jordan. It's got the parting of the Jordan. And in this case, it's quite descriptive. It's quite amazing. It says, and the priests came out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner they had set their feet on dry ground than the water of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. So here, it's quite very, very direct about using the Ark to actually stop the course of the water of the Jordan, let the tribes of Israel go through, 
and then as soon as they got out of there, the gravitational field of whatever you want to call it, uh, allowed the water to start running again. One thing that's really omitted is the paragraph right after, or shortly after, paragraph 23, for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. Remember, the Lord is the tetragrammaton described as the Ark of the Covenant. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what it had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. In this paragraph, very specifically, it says that the reason the Red Sea was crossed and opened up is because it was the Ark of the Covenant that was used to do it. The reason why this is typically omitted is because all uh, scholars believe that the Ark box was built after the crossing of the Red Sea at the foot of Mount Sinai. But the source power of that Ark box might have come right out of um, Egypt. And that might have been the power source of a technology much more advanced than anything we can dream of today. All right, so, so now I, I was able to place that the ark had been used to open the Red Sea and then open the Jordan. And then later, uh, it's used to make the walls of Jericho fall and then eventually is placed in the Temple of Solomon in the Holy of Holy and is actually the center worship of all of these um, Israelites. Today, the rock on which the ark used to be in the middle of the Temple of Solomon is under the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, uh, which is controlled by Islamic tradition. So the Islamic tradition actually are controlling and consider that place a very holy place because it said that uh, that Mohammed ascended from that central place in the Temple of Solomon. So now you've got Islamic tradition and Hebraic tradition crossing over at the Ark of the Covenant. And these people have been fighting for so long. <laughs> and so I started, I continued to study and I, I was, I was, um, I, something opened up. There's a whole set of information that opened up that we are not going to be able to go through tonight. We're going to go through some, but that leads from the Egyptian to the Hebrews, to the Muslim, to the Templars, to the Middle Age, to modern age, to America, and right to the $1 bill. And that set of knowledge has been leading and powering our government for a very long time. I think there is much more to what's going on that has to do with the search for this power. Eventually, I came across these things. They're called the Copper Scrolls. Again, Edgar Cayce, interestingly, in one of his esoteric reading, mentioned that scholars were going to find in the 70s, or I can't remember when, uh, uh, scrolls from a hidden society along the Dead Sea. Nobody really believed it. Uh, scholars said, well, we know pretty well everything that was around there. Um, there's no reason to believe there would be scrolls there or things like that. And sure enough, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, hidden in caves near Qumran. And a whole society of priests that were unknown until then to scholars uh, and that seemed to have been very reclusive, very hidden society. 
in those Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in those caves, there is one set of scroll that was completely different than the other ones. Why? Because they were written on copper, not on typical um, hides or, or, or papyrus or anything like that. They were written on copper, and when the copper of these scrolls were analyzed, it was found that it is the purest copper ever found on earth. All right? And when uh, they decoded these scrolls, uh, the, the way the scrolls are written, they're written backwards or upside down so that uh, you were supposed to roll clay around them and then unroll, and then you'd have the clay tablet, which would have it right side up. But when they opened them, they didn't realize that, so many of them cracked. So anyway, they decoded them, and they found that the text on the scrolls describes the Ark of the Covenant coming to the Essene community of the Qumran region. The Essene that wrote these scrolls say to have had possession of the Ark of the Covenant. And it described 64 components of this uh, that needed to be around the ark in order for everything to be okay. So there's all sorts of components that have to do with oils uh, that you anoint yourself before you walk into the ark uh, room uh, with uh, incense that has very specific herbs uh, that you need to... Uh, cleanse yourself with before you go into the ark room, all sorts of components that needed that came with the ark of the covenant. And not only does it say, that is it describe these 64 components, it says where they hid them in the mountains near Qumran. Uh, when these scrolls were found and made public, uh, it, it, it scared a lot of scholars up because they thought, oh my God, this is like a treasure hunt. People are going to try to come and dig everywhere. And, you know, so uh, there was a lot of publicity that these scrolls, although they were from that period of time and found with the other scrolls, may have been a hoax that was perpetuated then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just to throw everybody off, you know. Um this was unlikely for many other people, and basically they were trying to discourage people from going to dig around out there. Um, but a person was allowed to dig, and uh, this person um, went through the channels. It's called Vendel Jones, and he um, dug uh, in the uh, Qumran region and eventually found the, one of the first item on the list, which was the oil that you had to anoint yourself, which increased conductivity on the skin, by the way, uh, in order to go into the ark room. And Vendel uh, eventually found a second item, a second item as well, uh, based on the description that he was reading from these scrolls and going into the, uh, using the clues and finding them in the in the Kurman region. So let's take a look. Vendel Jones is respected here and abroad as a credible Torah teacher. He has been featured as a speaker in Orthodox synagogues nationwide and has represented the Israel Foreign Ministry in a two-year lecture forum on college panels in discussions with PLO representatives. Vendel was contracted by the Israeli government to write for their academic courses for tour guides at Hebrew University. In 1952, Vindel came across a news story that was to change his life. It was the account of the discovery of the Copper Scrolls. He was plagued by the realization that there were many anti-Jewish statements in the Gospels, and some were, as the marginal notes stated, omitted in more ancient manuscripts. did not surrender to be a preacher. I, I felt like I, I wanted to, to approach the Bible scientifically. 
It is so fitting that the Shemin Afar Shimon should be the first item found from the days of the temple. When the pilgrims were ascending to Jerusalem, before they were in view of the holy temple, they would smell the fragrance of the Shemin Afar Shimon. The pilgrims knew that shortly they would behold the glories of Beit HaMikdash in the holiest of holy cities, Jerusalem in the land of Judea. Jones has been scouring the ancient caves of Qumran for the past quarter century. The news of this discovery soon broke internationally with coverage from CNN, CBS, NBC, and ABC. That following year, the October issue of National Geographic featured the find, followed by the December issue of Omni Magazine, and countless other news sources carried the story worldwide. In the spring of 1992, the authenticity of the Copper Scroll was further enhanced with the discovery by Institute teams of a silo in the bedrock containing some reddish material, organic in nature. It was analyzed by the Weizmann Institute and two departments at Bailan University in Israel. The testing indicated the reddish material was a compound of 11 ingredients found in the Ketoret. I have absolutely no doubt this material is Tikkun Haqsoret. This was the Holy Temple incense. If we continue to find the items listed in the Copper Scroll and continue to locate them in the order that they're listed in the Torah, then the next thing we should find is the ashes of the red heifer. All things will be restored as even the Torah that Moses broke. Remember, he placed them back into the ark and God restored them. Moses wrote a Torah like the stones in the ark. Christian art has pictured the Torah as two tombstones, but that's not how they're described. In the book of Exodus chapter 32 and verse 15, we read, And Moses went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony. In Hebrew it reads, Luchot, not slabs, but sapphires. These were dihexagonal shaped like the sapphire molecule. <laughs> that last part is really important. Is really is is revealing information uh, that doesn't quite match the Christian interpretation of the Torah, where Moses is not said to have come down from the mountain with tablets with the Ten Commands on it, but actually sapphire type or crystalline type of structures that were hexagonal in nature. <laughs> when a guy like me hears stuff like that, <laughs> The fact that Mendel Jones has been able to find and locate these things in the, in the mountains of Qumran supports the concept that the ark was a true object. That this is not just some crazy story from an ancient book, but actually that this really happened. And that the, um, the civilizations or the, the communities at Qumran uh, had access in in any case had at one point or another the ark of the covenant in their midst now how could that be well it's found that imagine that you had an object of extreme power in the center temple and this might make you understand a little more why all these Wars have been raging in that section of the world for so long. Imagine that you had this amazing power, this amazing object at the center of your temple, but that your town, your city, uh, your uh, defense system could fail and this object could fall in the hands of uh, other civilization that wouldn't necessarily understand how to deal with it. You would have, I'm sure, an exit plan, a B plan. And I believe that their B plan was they had a community of high priests 
fairly far away from the temple that where high priests were constantly being trained in the order to be able to handle the Ark of the Covenant. So that if anything happened at the temple, the Ark would be swiftly uh, taken out through underground tunnels, and many of them have been found now, that would bring them out of the city and, and bring it to their uh, temple, to their place, so that they could handle it there and keep it safe. And that might be why no writing about that community was found by scholars for a very long time. Nobody knew they were there, either than this Bedouin that threw a rock in a cave, heard a pot break, and, and, and thought there may be something in there, and eventually found the Dead Sea Scroll. So all of a sudden, uh, it starts to make sense, and I, I, I was um, getting a better picture of my, what might have happened. Now, interestingly, there's new evidence that's coming out. And, well, there's a few things. One of them is that most of the writings of Qumran, most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, are not allowed to be re released to the public. Only, I believe, a uh, hundred scrolls have been released to the public, and the rest is not, um, uh, has not been released to the public at all. Um, I find that interesting. I wonder why. But certainly, the fact is, is that there is evidence that Joseph and Mary, the parents of the one that was actually called Emmanuel in the Bible, uh, the name of Jesus came later on, but in the Bible it's very specifically said to be Emmanuel, uh, were Essene and were from the Essene community. So imagine this child coming into the field of this extremely powerful object and growing into the field of it. Imagine having an object that is like a transducer for the power of space-time, all the information of the universe in that point. When you're close to it, there's a lot of information transduction that's going through your DNA. That could make you be able to do things that the average human beings cannot do. It's like a little torque on your space-time reality. <laughs> all right? And um, certainly walking on water is evidence of gravitational effects. At a recent press conference, famous videographer James Cameron and filmmaker Simcha Jakovavicki presented a controversial documentary called The Last Tomb of Jesus. The research reports on an ancient family tomb found under a construction site and documented by archaeologists in 1980. The controversy comes from the cluster of names that was discovered engraved on some of the ossuaries. One of the most prominent inscriptions reads, Joshua, son of Joseph, or Jesus, son of Joseph. Another bears the inscription, Maria, or the modern Maria, and yet another read, Marianni Mara in Greek, which may correspond to Mary Magdalena, as Marianne is the name found in the Acts of Philip to describe her. Though the names found on some of the ossuaries are common, it is significant to find all of these names with biblical references clustered in the same family tomb. More significant for our purposes is that it seems that many ossuaries of the first century Judea Christians bear a very specific geometric configuration. For example, the ossuary marked Marianni Mara bears very defined geometric decorations that in the context of our research have extreme significance. Indeed, once again we find the very structure of the cube octahedron or vector equilibrium engraved on an ancient artifact. It is even carved in such a way that the lobes or petal structures of the matrix are apparent in 3D. The same typical geometry is found on other ossuaries, one of which is marked Judah, son of Joshua. 
Certainly the claim that Mary Magdalena and Joshua may have had a child is controversial, but the symbols that are found on these ossuaries and others from the first century AD have striking significance. It is as well significant to note that both the one called Joshua or Emmanuel and Mary Magdalena were in some traditions considered to be a representation of the living ark. These symbols, as well as we have seen earlier, are found in many different traditions and specifically in the Egyptian Osirian Temple. This temple is associated with the resurrection of Osiris with the help of his consort Isis and may denote the structure of space-time and some of the most powerful and profound knowledge of the time. Significantly above the entrance of the tomb was a unique facade, a carefully crafted chevron and circle that mystified the archaeologists. In the words of Dr. Shimon Gibson, one of the archaeologists present at the opening of the tomb, there's no doubt about it that those symbols meant something. It's unlikely that the family or the person that came and carved out the tomb just carved these things at random. They had to symbolize something. What they symbolized, I don't know. But it's quite rare to find that kind of ornamentation on a simple tomb. Interestingly, thousands of years prior, at the beginning of the Pyramid Age, a mysterious conical stone deemed to have cosmic origins is found in ancient Egyptian traditions. The Binbin stone was housed in the Temple of the Phoenix and was associated with regeneration, rebirth, and celestial cycles and was thought to be the divine seed. The Benben stone disappeared long before Herodotus, an earlier Greek historian, visited Egypt, but not before it had relegated its name to the apex stone placed on top of pyramids or obelisks. One such example was found from the Pyramid of Amenemhet III and is housed at the Cairo Museum. It bears the inscription, King Amenemhet III sees the beauty of the sun. He sees the Lord of the Horizon sailing in his boat over the sky. Would this be the Lord of the Event Horizon flying in his ship in the sky? Interestingly, this most sacred object is almost a perfect match to the so-called chevron found at the entrance of what may be one of the most significant archaeological discoveries of our time. The chevron in circle is typical of the symbology of the ancient Egyptian all-seeing eye. Again, we see that this most important symbol in the Egyptian tradition was used to describe a fractional series from half to the magic fractional structure 1 64th. The symbol is as well found as representation of ultimate power on the top altar of Mayan temples and is depicted on walls in various ancient locations of the Americas. I continued to study some more and I realized that tetragrammaton in Kabbalistic tradition is typically um, denoted or described as this triangle structure with the, in this case, the letters of God in it. And if you actually look at the way the layers of God are laid out in it, um, it's like an isotropic vector metric, okay? So one, two, three, and four. There's four layers to the isotropic vector metric. If you took the first layer here, you'd have one, two, three, four on the bottom, three in the middle, two here, and then one on top, just like the way these letters are laid. And I uh, and the Kabbalistic tradition are very clear that you shouldn't take the letters at face value, that actually each letter has a mathematical number attached to it, and that it's the numbers that have a meaning as well. So if you look at the numbers of the Tetragrammaton, then it's 10, 5, 10, 6, 5, 10, and 5, 6, 5, 10. And they all add up to 72. And sure enough, in the Bible and various texts, you find that the number of God is 72. Or the number of faces of God and the great name of God is 72. So it all works. It's really nice. The thing is, the thing is, is that this is only 
a male God. It's missing its better half. Remember? It's missing its polarity. And so, imagine that you wanted to leave a code on a planet that's not so evolved, but you wanted to leave the code so that it would give them great power at an important time in history. But you wanted to make sure that it could not be decoded until they were ready for it. How would you do it? When maybe one way you would do it would be to give the code in a polarity way so that you would uh, have to have a civilization come to the realization of the equalities of polarity before they could decode the code. So, and that would most likely be a society that's ready for that type of power. So, when you take the male tetragrammaton and you add the female one or the positive and the negative one, then you have to add a second isotropic vector metric. So the result is that you would have to double this number. 72 twice is 144. 144 is in the book of Revelation as a very important number for the new uh, and the changes of the new world. When you put 64 tetrahedrons together and you get this fractal vectorial array, you get exactly 144 faces on its outside surface. And so that was getting compelling. But the Kabbalistics didn't stop there. The Kabbalistic traditions said, well, actually, if you want to truly understand the power of the Tetragrammaton, the power of God, if you want to understand the root of creation, you must decode this tree, which was thought to be the tree of knowledge, which is analogous to the tree at the center of the Garden of Eden. Uh, this was thought to be the foundation of creation. And that if anyone could decode this, uh, they would hold the key to creation. There's a lot of writing in Kabbalistic tradition that says as well that it shouldn't be attempted to be decoded <laughs> because most people that have have gone crazy. <laughs> and so I took those warnings seriously, but and I thought, well, I'm most likely already crazy. <laughs> well, I live in a van, you know. <laughs> I'm studying all this crazy stuff. I must be okay, you know. It won't hurt me that much. <laughs> so I went at it. And I studied and I studied and I studied and I tried to figure it out. And I couldn't really figure it out. I was really bugging on it because it was getting so complex. So many texts I was reading about this were so complex and so philosophical and they had all these realms and dimensions and all this. I couldn't figure it out. And then I decided to draw it and I plastered it on the ceiling of my van so that when I would wake up in the morning, I could just stare at it and try to figure it out. <laughs> and so uh, I'm in the van in the morning and I look at it and then, you know, I, fairly rapidly I realize that there's a tetrahedron on the bottom of it. Okay? This part here is a tetrahedron if it's seen in 3D. 
And then I looked up here, and I realized that uh, in 3D, those lines would generate as well a noctahedron. See, the thing is, is that most people don't see this thing as a 3D object. So flatten, it makes not much sense. But in 3D, it describes very specific geometry. So I, because I had this type of 3D mind, and I was always very intended on not doing the flat thing, um, I was trying to visualize this in 3D. And, but I couldn't figure out this middle box thing. I just couldn't figure it out for weeks, months. <laughs> Just like, you know, laying in my bed looking at this thing and studying and all this. And then one day, um, I said, wait a minute. I realized that one of those boxes in the middle here, okay, matches the box in the top portion of the octahedron. So I thought, what if I slid the middle part box in the upper box and see what it generates. So I split them in two, and then I slid the bottom part into the top part. And when I did so, it was like a key, right? It just locked in and generated all the vectors necessary to have a tetrahedron and an octahedron, one on top of each other. So now I had all these vertices for 3D ge geometry. These are the only geometry necessary to produce a 64 tetrahedron grid. So I knew I was close. <laughs> so I started to, I, I, I got really excited and I started to I continue studying and intensely studying, and I realized something, is that the Kabbalistic text doesn't say there's one tree at the root of foundation, uh, at the foundation of, of uh, the universe, or at the root of the universe. There is four trees at the root of the universe. And they said that the four trees were attached at the same root. Um, now I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe they're still giving us only half the code. Maybe there's eight trees, and they're only giving us the polarity, the half polarity of the code. I looked at my structure again that I had come up with from sliding the bottom into the top, and I realized I had extra lines. And these extra lines match the lines to generate the star tetrahedron. So if I got all the branches of the tree, and then I attach the eight trees together, I would have eight star tetrahedrons coming together to generate the 64 tetrahedron grid. And what told me had decoded this right was that by the time I was finished, I could now plaster the Kabbalistic tree right over top of the 64 tetrahedron grid and get all the nines of the 2D tree out of the 3D geometry. It worked. And hooked all together it generated all the intersection necessary to build a 64 tetrahedron grid. And when uh, I calculated this, then I saw that it could be done in many different ways. But one thing that was for sure, the Kabbalistic text said, actually, there's 10 spheres, they're called sephirot. And they come from the word sapphire, okay? So actually it's talking about crystals again. And it says that these sephirots are the joints between the pathways of creation. 
And it said that there was this 10 sephirot to one tree, but because they're whole hooked to the same center, to the same root, which is called the, um, the crown sephirot, which is described as a point of indwelling where God falls or God goes towards infinity. Okay? Basically describing a singularity. When, when they say that, they say that one doesn't count. So you get nine sephirot per tree. Well, if you have eight trees and you've got nine sephirot per trees, eight by nine is 72. And now you're right back to the 72 powers of God. And you've, the, the code has brought you all the way back to the beginning in a feedback loop of coding information. And so uh, I continue to find the solution to this. We did a small animation on how the trees come together. And so literally the trees compressing together, creating that collapse into singularity, generating the code. It's quite amazing. Then it generates all the joints necessary to produce the 64 tetrahedron grid. So I wrote a little thing on this. It's an old book I wrote. It was all my findings on ancient civilization. I didn't write anything on. I wrote some physics in there, but just layman physics because I wasn't prepared yet for that. And, uh, and at the day I was writing this part of this little booklet that some people here have, um, that day, while writing this, I decided to log on to the net and look at what, you know, is happening in the crop circle world. And sure enough, that crop circle occurred that day. <laughs> that was freaky. <laughs> so it really, you know, was an amazing journey through this information of the Bible and, and the codes of ancient civilization all around. And I, I really was taken by it. And, um, and, and it, it, it was so confirming and it just took, and every step of the way, it just kept on confirming. And, you know, in this short presentation, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't have time to go through all the details. I, I, I do give week-long presentations where, you know, we have time to go through all the details of things. And even then, in a week, I usually still run out of time. But um, there's uh, so many of this amazing confirmation that came along the path. You know, every step, every time I would doubt, something else would come out and grab me and, and show me the way. And it just... It, I'm just, um, and it brought me to a very different view of not only our past, but our possibility in the future and how we move from here to the next level, how this change that many of us, that so many of us are feeling on the planet uh, is going to occur and how we can help it and how we can help ourselves through it. To this day, I'm finding stuff. I mean, it's amazing. There's so much stuff out there that relates to this. It's almost like there's nothing else. And in case of this being correct, then there isn't really anything else. Uh, there is this amazing structure of the vacuum that generates reality as we see it, that generates or existence, and it basically oozes out of us throughout our civilization, throughout our understanding, throughout our physics, throughout our advanced thinking. And it really brings us to an, a, a different way of relating the world. And in this way of relating into the world, and that's where I believe that the New Testament and the Old Testament comes together. Because... I believe that the Old Testament is talking about very advanced technology 
and that the New Testament is talking about where you have to be in, able, in, in being able to have this level of technology. And that when the two come together, then you have a complete being, you have a complete master, you have a civilization that has reached levels of masteries in which they have an equilibrium between their external world and their internal world. They have understood that they hold singularity, that they are in contact with the universe within their existence, even within their physical existence, which is made from subatomic mini black holes connecting all things together. And from that perspective, a civilization would build a completely new set of technology, a completely new set of interaction and civilization of relationship with each other, and certainly realize their common goal and their common aspiration. I always say this, you know, this model tells us really that the surface of a planet is like an event horizon from which each individual is a little sun ray, right? And that sun ray has a very specific vector direction in space in which it gathers a very specific set of information. However, all of our feet are pointing to the same singularity, to the same center and connecting us all. And that singularity holds us on the surface of this planet as our gravitational field. And if we get to this, I believe we can develop technology out of this that will bring us to the stars. And if, and I think, and, and you know, that's my understanding at this point, that this is the crucial time to be able to transcend our way of doing things to the way that we need to be able to do things in order to survive the changes that are coming into our solar system and move to the next level of interaction and maybe even connect with other civilizations that have been in our galaxy, that have been observing us, that have been waiting for us to graduate and enter a larger community, a larger galactic community, uh, and, and move on from here. So thank you very much for all your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.